a person suffers from hypermetropia or long sight. Use of a spectacle lens of power plus 2.0D allows the person to just see clearly an object placed 24 centimeters away from the eye. Explain why the unaided defective eye cannot form a clearly focused image of the object placed 24 centimeters from the eye. Now we're dealing with a convex lens here rather than a concave lens. The answer to this is that the lens isn't convex enough. It's not powerful enough at a value of plus 2.0D. So for the first mark, we can say that the rays can't be bent enough or that the lens isn't powerful enough. For the second mark, you need to explain the effect that this will have, i.e. that the lens will not be able to bend the light enough so that it focuses on the retina. There are two points made here, one mark for each, so two marks. An object is placed 24 centimeters from the spectacle lens. Calculate the distance of the image formed from the spectacle lens. Give your answer to a suitable number of significant figures. For the first mark, we need to write down and use the formula that we would need to calculate the distance of the image. So we've got one over U plus one over V is equal to one over F, if I just label that. So we have U representing the object distance, V representing the image distance, and F representing the focal length. So the best thing to do here would be to substitute in the values that we know, and those are U and F. So we have 0 0.24 meters as the object distance. Notice how I've converted this into meters rather than centimeters. We've got one over V because we don't know what the image distance is. That's what we're trying to find. And then because the focal length is a half, we're doing one divided by a half to give us two. Remember that the power of the lens is the reciprocal of the focal length. So rearranging this equation to make V the subject. So we end up with minus 0 0.46 meters which when we convert into centimetres will be minus 46. Notice how I've rounded this value from my calculator into two significant figures, because that's the number of significant figures that are given to us in the values in the question. So in terms of marks for this question, you'll get your first mark for stating the equation and substituting in the values, a second mark for calculating the correct value, and a third mark for getting the correct number of significant figures. So three marks there. What is the name for the position where the image is formed by the spectacle lens? Tick the correct answer. Now remember that the person is far sighted, so they won't be able to focus on objects that are too close. So the answer to this would be the eye's unaided near point. So the image formed by the spectacle lens is then formed at that point where the eye is able to focus the light unaided, which without the lens won't be on the retina. So you get one mark for saying that. Draw a ray diagram to show how this spectacle lens forms an image of the object placed 24 centimeters from the spectacle lens. On your diagram, clearly label the object, an image, and a principal focus of the lens. Your diagram does not have to be drawn to scale. So the first thing to do here would be to draw the axes. Then it would be useful to draw the position of the object. The paths of the light rays would be as follows. And we can mark off the position of the focal point. What we'll then need to do is extrapolate those two lines back to a point where they cross over. This point where they cross is the position of the image, and that's your completed diagram. Remember that all straight lines need to be drawn with a ruler. In terms of marks, the first mark will be obtained for drawing one of those rays correctly, doesn't matter which one. Your second mark will be for correctly drawing both rays and the image. And if you've labeled the image, the object, and one principal focus, then you get the third mark. Now I've labelled those as I, O and F, but I'll put those in, in full just for sake of completion. So three marks there. A patient with a suspected broken arm is going to have an X-ray image taken. Explain the risk to the patient of exposure to X-rays. Go on to discuss three ways by which the design and use of the X-ray equipment minimises this risk. This is a six mark question. It's not as simple as gaining a mark for each point made. But in order to get four marks, we definitely need to explain that risk fully and discuss those three methods in detail. Now, the risk of those X-rays is to do with the fact that they are ionizing radiation. If you're exposed to too much ionizing radiation, then you're at a higher risk of mutations or cancer. So let's write that down first of all. Now let's take a look at some of the methods. So the first thing that we can do is use lead diaphragm plates, which will mean that only the area being investigated is hit with x-rays and not any other part of the body. You could describe this as a way of pre preventing collateral damage. 
the next thing you could say is that an image would only be produced when the X-ray photons have enough energy and some of those X-ray photons that are produced will not be energetic enough, so they're not needed. So we may as well remove those from the situation so that they don't go into the body and increase the risk of mutations or cancer. You could also adjust the anode voltage. So in terms of the actual machine producing the X-ray photons, if you select which photon energies you want, you're more likely to get a higher number of photons which can produce an image. So a similar effect to the second point. So there we've made three points on three different methods to reduce the exposure. Now I'm going to include a few more that you could also include, but you don't need to include these to get the full six marks. So we can use intensifying screens with the film to shorten the exposure time, effectively using a lower intensity of x-rays, so reducing the risk to the patient, but doing more with that low intensity. We can also place a grid between the patient and the image receptor, which means that we don't get x-ray scattering, which would mean that we'd need to take further x-rays. So those are the two other points that you could make. Now in terms of marks, this is fully detailed in the mark scheme, but in order to get all six marks, you would need to explain the risk fully and give enough detail on those three methods. Now, if you were to mention three methods, but not provide enough detail on one of them, you would then lose a mark and a lack of detail on another method would then lose another mark and so on. And it would scale down from there. It will be down to the judgment of the examiner regarding whether the discussion of a method has enough detail. The blood vessel called the aorta passes through the abdomen. A second patient with a suspected fault in the wall of the aorta can be given an ultrasound scan or an X-ray of the abdomen. Suggest with reasons which is the better procedure for investigating the suspected fault. Now it's clear here that for a procedure such as this, it would be better to use ultrasound because it's non-ionizing. So in the previous question, remember we spoke about how X-rays are ionizing radiation. So that would be the first point to make. And that would be your first mark. The other thing to note is that X-rays are only really good with bone. It's tricky to distinguish with X-rays between tissue and blood. So that's why ultrasound would be better. And that would be your second mark. So in order to get those two marks, you need to make those two points. When ultrasound travels across a boundary from blood to the wall of the aorta, there is a decrease in acoustic impedance across the boundary. This results in 0.0625% of the intensity of the incident ultrasound being reflected at the boundary. Calculate the acoustic impedance of the aorta wall tissue. We've got the acoustic impedance of blood, which is 1.64 times 10 to the 6 kilograms per meter squared per second. So let's first of all write down the equation for acoustic impedance. And let's add some labels. So we've got IR representing the intensity of the reflected ultrasound. We've got I0 representing the original intensity of the ultrasound. Now IR divided by I0 is just going to be that 0.0625%. And then we've got the ultrasound traveling from a medium with an acoustic impedance of Z1 into a medium with an acoustic impedance of Z2. Now the first thing that we should do is square root both sides of the equation. Now you'll notice in the question, it says that there is a decrease in acoustic impedance across the boundary. Now since that happens, we know that we need to use the negative value of that square root of, of IR over I0. So let's substitute in our values. We can then rearrange this to make Z2 the subject which gives us a value of 1.56 times 10 to the 6. And we can write this into the answer space and the unit is already given. Now in terms of marks for this question, the first mark will be for correctly substituting the necessary values into the original equation, which we have actually done lower down. The second mark will be for correctly selecting the negative root by noticing that the value of Z decreases. Your third mark will be for rearranging the equation correctly. And then your fourth mark will be for getting the correct answer. So four marks there. A patient is going to have a PET scan, and that stands for positron emission tomography scan. A small amount of radioisotope is injected into the patient's bloodstream and the patient is left to relax. The patient then lies on a horizontal table and is moved into the PET scanner. The scanner has many detectors positioned in a vertical circular pattern around the patient. State what is meant by a radioisotope. Now, 
isotopes are nuclei of the same element which have different numbers of neutrons. Some of those isotopes can be stable, but a radioisotope is an unstable isotope, which is prone to the emission of ionizing radiation. So that's what we're going to write down. And that's your first mark. The radionuclide used in the PET scan has a physical half-life of 110 minutes. The radionuclide is excreted from the body with a biological half-life of 185 minutes. Show that the effective half-life of the radionuclide in the body is about 70 minutes. So we need to first of all write down the equation that ties those three quantities together. So that's the equation. Let's just add some labels. Now we want to find the effective half-life, so let's re rearrange this equation slightly to make effective half-life the subject. And then substitute in the values. And that gives us a value of 68.98 minutes, which of course is about 70 minutes as it rounds to that value. Now to get that mark, you need to show your calculated value at the end with a complete method. Discuss what might be a suitable length of time for the patient to relax between injecting the radionuclide and moving the patient into the PET scanner. Now, given the fact that the effective half-life is 70 minutes, and that was a show of that question previously, it suggests that we need to use that 70 minutes in a later question such as this. So a suitable length of time would be 70 minutes, any longer than this, and potentially too much of that radionuclide would be gone. So I've just said there, maybe lower, but no less than 10 minutes, because we need to make sure that the radionuclide moves around the body enough to get to where it needs to go. And that's going to be our second mark. It's worth noting here that in terms of the first mark, you should reference the fact that 70 minutes relates to the half-life. So those are our first two marks there. We need to add more detail to what that time allows us to do. The other thing to say is that the part of the body where the isotope is used up needs enough time to actually use up that isotope. And that's going to be our third mark. So three marks there. The decay of the radionuclide results in the emission of a positron. Two of the detectors directly opposite to each other are triggered as they each received a gamma photon. Explain the process in which the gamma photons are created. Now this process is called annihilation where we have some matter and some antimatter and they come into contact and they annihilate to produce photons. The name given to the matter will be electrons, the name given to the antimatter will be positrons. So we can make that our first mark. So there's our first mark. The second mark will be for mentioning that the energy of the photons is equal to the mass of the original positron and electron. And that's our second mark. Another point that you could make to gain a mark is that the photons would have to travel in opposite directions to conserve momentum. So that's an alternative second mark. So two marks there. Figure one shows the head of a patient that is 0.2 meters across, placed centrally between two of the many detectors in a PET scanner. But figure one there, as described, with a head of width 0.2 meters, a detector on either side. To determine the position where the gamma photons are produced between the detectors, the scanner measures the short interval of time delta t between the triggering of the first detector and the triggering of the second detector. Discuss for the detector positions shown in figure one the range of the values of delta t that the scanner must measure to perform a PET scan on the head. Assume that the speed of the gamma photons in the head is 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. Now that 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second is the speed of light. Now, if we've got a head width of 0.2 meters with detectors on either side, we could have a scenario where two photons are emitted right from the center and go in opposite directions. In this scenario, they would reach either detector at the same time, so delta t would be zero. But what you could get is a scenario where the photons are emitted from one side. It's a bit trickier to see there against the dark hair color, but the photon that's emitted to the right will immediately hit the detector whereas the photon that's emitted to the left will have to travel the 0.2 meters at the speed of light to reach the other detector. So the difference in time between those two detectors being received will be equal to the time taken for the photon traveling to the left to cross the width of the head. So we need to put that into words. So I'm talking there about the 
speed distance time equation in which the time taken to travel from one side of the head to the other is equal to the distance or the width of the head divided by the speed, which in this case is the speed of light. So if we substitute the values given to us and make a calculation. So we end up with 6.7 times 10 to the minus 10 seconds. Now that should really round to 7 times 10 to the minus 10 seconds as the values given to us are only to one significant figure. That's the largest amount of time that it could take. As I said before, photons would be emitted from one side of the head, so one immediately goes into a detector, but the other one takes that period of time to reach the other side. So our first mark will be for making this calculation. Our second mark will be for putting this into a range of time values. So the time difference could be as low as zero. As I said before, we could have two photons emitted from the center of the head, which take equal amounts of time to reach a detector. It could also be as high as seven times 10 to the minus 10 seconds. As I said before, both photons could be emitted from one side of the head. So one photon goes straight into a detector, but the other takes seven times 10 to the minus 10 seconds to go from one side to the other. So that's our range of values of delta T. And for stating that range, including the fact that it could be as low as zero, we will get our second mark. So two marks there. Figure two shows an ECG trace for a healthy person. Complete figure two by adding a suitable unit and scale to the potential axis and a suitable scale to the time axis. Now we've got a graph here, figure two, with an ECG trace. You've got the potential at the body surface, on the y-axis and the time on the x-axis as said in the question. So we just need to add the suitable scales to both and then a suitable units on the y-axis. So starting with the units, we measure that potential in millivolts. That's something that you'll need to remember for the exam. For the scale on the y-axis, the line originally starts out at zero millivolts, and the highest peak at R is just below one millivolt. In terms of the time scale, if we put zero at the beginning of the axis, and a complete cycle of this ECG trace will typically be over in about 0 0.6 seconds. Now for the scale on the x-axis, you can go up to 0 0.6, but you are allowed to go a little bit higher as long as it's not above one. So in terms of marks for this question, you'll get your first mark for getting the suitable unit and scale on the y-axis and a second mark for getting the right time scale on the x-axis. So two marks there. Figure three shows a faulty ECG trace, which was obtained for another healthy person. Now we've got figure three there, which overall has a very similar shape to the trace in figure two. But you can see the line is a lot more fuzzy. It jumps up and down a lot more. Discuss three possible reasons why this faulty trace was obtained. Now, there are a range of reasons here detailed in the mark scheme, but when listing these, you need to make sure that you include reasoning for each one. So the first one that we're going to look at is the idea that the electrodes connected to the person are not secured properly. And the effect that this will have on the trace is that every time an electrode disconnects from the person, there will be a jump in voltage because it will be taking a different reading. The second possible reason is that the patient isn't keeping still, which has a similar reasoning to the first point in that one of those electrodes could become disconnected and again will cause a jump in the voltage. So we're going to include a similar reason here. And for our third point, it's worth talking about the amplifier that's used to take this tiny signal and amplify it so that it's more noticeable and scale it up so it's more noticeable on a computer. So I've said that the amplifier is not low noise. And what that means is a low noise amplifier will take a very tiny signal like that found in an ECG and it will scale up that signal but remove the noise in the background. But if the amplifier is not low noise, then the background noise will be scaled up with the signal so it will appear a lot more fuzzy on the screen. So we've got three points there. Each of those is going to be worth a mark but you need to remember to include the reasoning for each one so that you can secure that mark.